Hey guys, um, <laughs> welcome to the program. We are having um, a lot of uh, technology issues, um, specifically our producer, um, Albie, who kind of gets all the calls and makes everything work on the different platforms. Um, the internet went down in his entire area, so um, he's unable to link us to the other platforms, but I said, well, I can go on Facebook and go live and just... Um, talk to people and you can text in your questions or uh, message in your 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 questions here. Um, I see some people are coming out. So I am live, right? You guys can see me, right? Somebody say hi. I think I see the little people's things. Hello, 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 hello. Can somebody say, yes, you are there? Can somebody say, Henry, you are in the universe and you do exist and... You, nobody's saying that. Um, we're just, I'm just seeing names. Somebody say, yes, we hear you. Would somebody please say that? Maybe we can get that to work. Um, still not hearing it. I guess I'm live. I'm going to act like I'm live. Okay. Well, yeah. Thank you, Deborah. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Um, anyway, welcome to the Dr. Cloud Show. This is a different one because I am doing it as just a Facebook Live, but we're going to post it on the other platforms. You can tell your friends. Um, normally, we take calls, and I can hear from you and see what you're thinking about. And we take calls about all of life on this program, and today, um, we can't do that. But what we can do is, here's the way we're going to do this. All right, so... Um, you are going to put your questions up. Now, I probably, when I'm answering one, won't be able to see it, but um, Jessica, who is uh, the one that does all the Facebook stuff for our team, she's going to get your questions, and she is going to text them to me. And so we should have that going pretty quickly here. So if you do have questions that you'd like for me to address today, I'll do my best. Um, just uh, put them right there on the... On the doodad. Is doodad, doodad's a uh, technical term, right? Put them on the doodad. There you go. Okay, so um, those of you who've been long-time listeners, long time, we've been doing this, what, three months now or so, um, want to welcome you back. Also, welcome any new listeners or viewers or however you do this. Um, thanks for joining us. We talk about life here. We talk about the ways we hurt and our anxieties and depressions and burnout and addictions and all that fun stuff you like to wake up in the morning and think about. Um, and also relationships, which are what kind of why sometimes you get depressed and anxious and all that, because it's the relationships in life that so kind of undergird a lot of how we're doing. And then the third area, what I call the performance area, is how we're doing in our in our dreams and goals and, you know, taking our talents and abilities and and building stuff and creating stuff and working stuff and getting to where you want to go with your talents. All of that comprises the pie of life, I think. And then I believe that through all those pieces, you know, our faith and spiritual uh, development and where we are in our spiritual life, that affects all three of those as well. So we talk about that. Feel free to bring that up. Okay, so we are here. Um, you know what? I think that um, we're going to go to go to questions here in a moment when we start to get some. Let's see uh, if Jessica has has sent me. You know what? I already have a question here. Why don't we um, Why don't we take this one from Christina, who asks, um, "How do you handle someone who always uses the excuse for their behavior that they can't control their emotions because they have a switch?" and they don't care at that moment. How do you know someone who always uses the excuse for their behavior that they can't control their emotions because they have a switch and they don't care at that moment? I guess they don't care enough to hit the switch. Is that it? Sort of like, could you please turn the lights out? And they go, no, I got a switch, but I don't really care enough right now, even if the lights are bothering you. Um, okay, not quite sure what all this means, but but let me kind of take a little bit of a stab at it from a uh, kind of general how you deal with, with, and I don't know what narcissist means either, but in terms of how you're using it, you know, that's a confusing term nowadays. Everybody uses it in a different way. But let's just say that in this instance, what narcissist means is somebody that's pretty much all about themselves, right, and their experience and what's important to them. And and we're in a relationship with somebody like that, sometimes you can feel like an object. You know, your needs and feelings and concerns aren't really 
listened to. They're not the priority for that person. So I'm assuming from this that somebody like that isn't handling their emotions well and they're getting angry and you know something that somehow is affecting you so i'm just going to assume that so the first thing we do i want you to just follow the normal path here but the first thing we do in a relationship if you step on my toe or i step on your toe which is what we're talking about here emotions you know there's some outburst that steps on your toe you say um you know what that that didn't feel good um could you not do that i um Okay, guys, I am taking a phone call from a person on the team, which means something out there is not not working on this, even if I'm live. Um, Greg, you and I are now on Facebook. Um, so, uh, are we? Yeah, you called me in the middle of answering a question. All my peeps are out there being really patient, but I hope this is about our broadcast. What do we do? We have solved our Oh. We've solved our technical issues. We have a choice to make. Okay. Um, well, we can, um, why don't we just continue? Because uh, it would take us a little while to get hooked up, right? Okay. I, we'll just continue. We're getting some questions here um, that are good, but I appreciate your call. And um, I'm, I'm waving at everybody on the screen there. Um, everybody say hi to Greg. Okay. All right. Talk to you later. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Bye. Well, they did solve the issues where we could do call in, but I think we would we would miss some time here trying to get hooked up on it. Um, but anyway, so you're you're in this relationship. This person's all about themselves for whatever reason, and you say, "I step on your toe." And you go, "That didn't feel good." Um, I could you could you please not do that? Okay, so in a normal with a normal person, what do they do? They go, "Oh gosh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Wouldn't want to hurt your toe." Okay, I won't do that again. Thank you for telling me. Thank you for telling me. I appreciate it. Well, what you're saying here is they step on your toe and you tell them and they go, well, there's nothing I can do about it because I got a switch and I just don't care at the moment. Okay. Well, then they told you something. They told you they don't care. Okay. So you can't fix that. What you can do is you can say, well, gosh, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. I did want to hang out with you. But as long as you're screaming at me or whatever it is, um, I just, I, I really, I just can't be around that. And so I'm going to go in the other room. I'm going to go get a coffee or I'm going to take a walk or, you know, maybe we'll get together next week if you're friends or whatever. But um, if you can't, if you can't stop yelling at me, then I'll, I'll go somewhere else. We get together again when you, when you feel like you care enough to hit the switch. Okay. So have a nice day. All right, so here's the principle here. Remember, boundaries are not about, you know, we don't put boundaries on someone else. Like, it's not this, this hat you can put on their head, and all of a sudden they, they stop the behavior, right? If we could do that, we'd cure all the drug addictions in the world. Here, where are the boundaries at? I'm going to put some boundaries on your addiction. <clears throat> we put it on their head, and they, you know, they don't do that anymore. That's not what you do. A boundary is about yourself. So, I have a limit. I have a boundary on my property line. And if you're doing this, then and it's falling over the fence and it's hurting me. I can set a limit on myself. The boundary is on me. It's not on them. So I say, well, then I can't be around this. Um, and when you when you choose to, you know, hit the switch and stop yelling, then I'll come back. OK, but you're in control of yourself. See, that's the big freedom giving thing about boundaries. You don't have to wait for somebody else's life to be different for yours to stop being affected by how they're not making their life different because you can take control of your own life and that's freedom and that's good, good self-control. Okay. So let me um, ask Jessica. Um, yes, Jessica, I do want you to send uh, questions. We're really winging it here today, guys. I get, you know, part of my team's in Nashville and parts in Seattle and parts in, in, uh, San Francisco, we're trying to get all this coordinated. Um, but let me just um, find one here. Um, so let me see. Um, I have trouble regulating my emotions, Barb asks. Was being molested as a child by my dad, did that affect that? 
Um, well, I don't know because I don't know all about you and when you were molested, how you were molested in terms of severity, how old you were, how secure you were at the time, other support. Did somebody step in and, and help you? There's so many things that go into that. I can tell you this, they all add up to, I'm sorry that happened and that's bad. Okay, so I'm sure it affected you in some way, right? Um, or you wouldn't still be talking about it. But the emotional regulations, yes, it can be tied to that, okay, in this way. I'm going to go two routes on this. And went this way, so, you know, molestation is a trauma, right? That's that's something that occurs that that it, it, uh, it overtaxes the system, in your ability to deal with what's happening in the experience. See, we're supposed to have feelings and the system metabolizes that. We're sad, oh, I'm sad, you know, we talk about it and then it kind of moves through the system and we resolve it. Well, a, a, an abuse of some sort, what that does is that traumatizes the system where it just lights up and, and you can't, It'd be like a, putting a fire hydrant to a, a, an eyedropper. You can't get all the emotion and everything through the pipes to where it comes back down. That's why you have post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Post. After the trauma, it's still there because it hasn't been processed yet. So sometimes what happens is that whole system is actively, you know, um, on fire. You know, you look at pictures of the brain. And so... That's that is that throws off emotional regulation, and that could be part of it. Okay, so I would encourage you to make sure you're getting with somebody working through all the traumatic, you know, all the traumatic stuff you went through with all that. Okay, now that's one side. The other side is the overall equipment um, of who we are as a person. Now, I don't mean that in a moral way, a good person or a bad person. What I mean is that when you and I were growing up, and I want everybody to hear this, because this is kind of a big deal, kind of a big deal. How can you be kind of a big deal? It's either a big deal or it's not, Henry. It's a big deal. This is a very big deal. <sighs> All right. Sorry, I'm frustrated with myself. I can't control my emotions right now. The equipment, okay? You and I have, like, call it a circuit board, you know? Um, if you're in a house, you got a board up there and all the wires come into it and it takes the power and it converts it and it sends it all where it's supposed to be or the way your computer works or any of that stuff. All right. So when we are growing up, remember this phrase, what was on the outside becomes inside. See, this equipment is supposed to be internalized from our key relationships. It starts in infancy when a baby is, wee, 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 wee. you know, and they're, they're like that. They're exploding, right? Well, what? Mom or caretaker, dad, grandma, whoever comes in, picks up that infant and starts to soothe it and rock it and use soft tones and wrap it up in a little blanket burrito where it feels contained and safe. And then it starts to settle down, okay? then they never have to do that again until about three hours later. Wee, 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 wee. And then it happens again, right? And so they come and they pick them up and they soothe them. Well, after about 500,000 instances like that, the neurological system is internalizing the holding, internalizing the soothing, internalizing the kind of saying it's going to be okay, internalizing the security, and what was once on the outside becomes inside, becomes part of your equipment. Well, then you get a little older, what happens? And you become a toddler, and then you go start exploring stuff, and then we get a whole new world falling down, and I hear no, and I don't like it, and I get, ah! you know, and I'm throwing tantrums and all that, and what does a good parent do? I remember those days of time out with, with my girls. It was so fun. I... I I loved it because it gets so funny sometimes. But I, <laughs> Olivia, one time, I, I put her in timeout, and she's like staring at me. And and so I'm trying not to laugh, right? And she's like looking at me, glaring. And then gradually, you know how you mirror each other? Gradually, this is a two-year-old. She like starts to And I started laughing, and I lost it and the whole time out was blown right but normally what they do is they protest right 
And so what do you have to do? The parent regulates the protest, okay? And I'd say, my girls, okay, stop screaming, use your words. Use your words. Not going to listen to screaming. Use your words. And they'd start screaming and go, no, when you're ready to use your words, tell me. And I was helping them calm down and start to put words to their experience so other parts of the brain begin to you know, get connected in, like language and sequencing and, and meaning and all that kind of stuff. And then what happens is, as they do that, is, well, I'm upset because, okay, and that, now we can talk about it, right? Or if they were continuing to scream, you know, and time out early on, I'd say, okay, here's a timer. You got to stay in here for two minutes, watch the hand. But if you start screaming again, because you want to get out early, then the clock starts earlier. Where I mean, we're going to start it over. So you got to be quiet for two minutes, okay? Well, what are they doing? In a relationship, they're learning how to process. And they're learning how to deal with all of those emotions. And the equipment is being internalized. See, we're installing stuff. That's why you'll see people get upset and they go, okay, calm down, just take a second. They're talking to themselves. Well, they're talking to themselves because somebody talk to them like that or they learn that and they internalize it. So that could be another reason. Maybe you didn't have parents that helped you talk through your emotions, put words to them, listen to them, empathize with them, set limits on the destructive ones and all of that. And that's why we get in new relationships with people that can empathize with us, people that can say, well, tell me what you're feeling. What do you mean by that? Put some words to that. There's What are they saying as an adult to you? Use your words, use your words. And once you get the words and the feelings hooked up, then you've got metabolizing experience going on and you're starting to move it, move it down the pipes. Okay. Hope that helps. So work on your equipment as well as the trauma. Um, all right. So um, I don't know if Jessica heard me say I did need her to send me some questions, but I'm not getting any yet. Um, so I am going to... Uh, Take another question here. I, I'm, I'm not in real time with you guys. Sorry, because they, they fill us up and I can't scroll and I can't talk and do all this stuff at the same time. It's it's the it's the problem of being the you know the COVID lockdown, one person sitting here trying to do all this uh, problem problem. Okay. All right, so uh, Nancy Fay. Let's talk to Nancy Fay. Nancy Fay, I hope you're from the South because I grew up in the South. And everybody has double names in the South. But it says here if you're from Santa Clara. So, oh, a Nancy Fay from Santa Clara. Okay. Good to meet you. Um, two people are coming over tonight who spread vicious gossip about me and my husband. Ooh. They want to repair the damage. I'm open to forgiving and creating safe boundaries until trust is proven. My husband wants to tell them to go back to everyone they gossip to and make it right. Which one of us is on the right track? Um, you want to forgive and let trust go. So you're kind of looking, you know, clear up the damage and forward looking he wants them to, to fix it. I think the first thing I would do is you and your husband sit down before the people come over and listen to each other's needs because he has a need for them to go do this for some reason. And maybe if you talk through that, um, sometimes it really is needed um, because there's material damage that's done that has ongoing effects like said something about you and now, now, now those people won't talk to you anymore. Okay. That, that would be an example. I would try to help bring out of him and listen and try to figure out how much of this is, is there's no real material effect out there. What we call damages, you know, in the legal world. Um, but it's more like, uh, it just feels crummy to have them not go do that. And on the feeling crummy side, um, my hunch is if the people aren't holding it against you and this, that, and the other, then the, the direct relationships with them usually kind of sort of like work themselves out. But if it is affecting the relationship, then he could do it himself. He could say, you know, I know that you heard this and we talked 
I talked with them and they apologized, but I just wanted to set the record straight with you. If there's anything you want to ask me about what you heard, I'll be glad to tell you, you know, the real story. Maybe some of what you heard is right. Maybe some of it's wrong. Maybe it's all wrong. I don't know. But what I do want is I want us to, and here's the bottom line, you know, as you guys think about this, um, you want your relationships to be based on an accurate perception of you. And so the relationships that you're talking about that need to go to and be repaired or not, I think the question is, well, how accurately are those people seeing you? So now if they think something factually wrong that you went and robbed a bank and now they won't, you know, come around you because they're afraid you're going to rob them. Well, then that they don't have an accurate perception. So I would worry about that. Um, certainly somebody's apologizing. I'd be forgiving. Um, you can talk about, you know, what do they want going forward? What do you want going forward? I don't know if I quite trust that, but maybe we could inch into this or not. But going forward depends on, on what you want and kind of what's what's proven there. So I'd rather you guys just listen to each other before and then get on the same page then. Um, and he could hear from you what your concerns are about that. I don't know why why that's an issue. You know, you got some reason. And so maybe y'all can talk through that. You give up yours, he gives up his, one of you comes the other way. You'll figure it out if you talk about it. But listen to each other's needs of why you want to do it that way. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, oh, here's an interesting one. I love questions like this because I, you know, I'm a psychologist, right? You know that I love, 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 love my field. Um, I, I'm, I'm one of those nerds that stays up all night reading technical journals and articles and books about, you know, junk that would bore you. I love it. But here is a question that I love also because my second love, I love theology. And I've, uh, I've been deeply involved in it for a long time. Um, so here's the question. And now it disappeared from my screen. How does that work? The question was, uh, ah, here it is. Um, so can a born again Christian be a narcissist? A narcissist behavior is so selfish and cruel and anti-Christian that it seems like an oxymoron to talk about a Christian narcissist. What a great question. What a great question. It kind of goes with the question of, how come some Christians are just such jerks, right? Or such whatever. I mean, if it's supposed to work, it's supposed to work, <laughs> right? It's what the Bible says. But that's not what all of that's not all what the Bible says. So let me just take a few minutes, uh, a few minutes to kind of unpack this. Look, here's the deal. Here's God. Here's humanity. Once upon a time, when He first made us and called us into life, we were in a relationship with Him, and everything was good. The computer was plugged up to the source. We got all the right programming. We didn't get any viruses. You know, everything was working fine. Okay. And then what we did was we made, as a human race, we made the narcissistic leap. We said, no, nope, I don't want to answer to you, God. I want to be God. I want everything to revolve around me. I want to be like Lucifer said and sit in the seat of the Most High. So, what we did was, what is narcissism at its heart in part is it's the wish for everything to be about you or me. You know, the wish for it's a selfish, self-centered. It's all about me. I'm God. And also it's the unplugging from love. Narcissism is not love. So you got a two-step dance there, right? I'm it's all about me and relationship has been unplugged from. So the human race goes over here, leaves God and love on the other side, and now we find ourselves over there. Now in that bucket of humans, there's all sorts of different people that get various degrees of what God put into the earth that's still around. You know, he created this earth with goodness in it. So love still exists, right? Good parenting still exists. Sacrifice, loyalty, 
faith, hope, charity, all that kind of stuff still exists, but it's also it's also in a pool that's been infected. So our love is not pure a lot of times. Sometimes it's enabling or codependent or selfish love. Sometimes our, our expression of strength is not pure. Sometimes it's controlling and manipulative instead of serving each other well. So everything good has been infected by bad. Now, some people have a cold of that kind of infection in a sense. What I mean is they're not living out the full degree of what it means to be separated from life. And other people have gotten pretty good at it, right? They're doing everything almost as bad as you can do it, right? And so here's the point. When somebody comes back into a relationship with God through Jesus, which is what born again means. It says, I want to have a relationship with you and thank you for forgiving me and letting me back in the family. They're going to show up as they are. So if an idiot becomes a Christian, what do you have the next day? you got a Christian idiot, right? If a narcissist becomes a Christian, the next day, what do you have? You got a Christian narcissist, which means you got a narcissist just like they were the day before, but now they've been forgiven and God goes to work at them in them to say, okay, I'm going to take you on a path where you come back to the way it ought to be in the beginning, where we're not just concerned about you. The whole planet has other concerns as well. Besides your little world, and we want you to learn to sacrifice and live like Jesus, to give yourself for other people, to care about compassion, empathy, love, and justice. And through a long process, God begins to take us through getting rid of the stuff that gets in the way of love and training us into people and the stuff that enhances love. Okay? Well, it sounds like you've run into somebody that somehow, if they're being honest about their their conversion, somehow, somehow they're either not very far into it or they haven't had the right kind of body functions around them, people around them to help them get healed from that narcissism, or they themselves are resisting. See, we can resist God's efforts to change us. That's what a fool does. When we get confronted by someone, somebody gives us feedback, that may be God talking to me. And what the wise person does is listen to God speak through other people and take it in. Well, a fool, the Bible says, is not going to listen. They're going to blame and excuse and get defensive. So it may be that that person is staying in a very foolish stance. And every time God tries to speak to them, they push him away because they're not recognizing it as God. And they may be waiting for a burning bush. But God sent a counselor or a spouse or a kid or a boss or a friend or a neighbor and say, dude, you know, that's not good the way you're treating me or somebody else. And if we would hear that as God speaking to us, then we could get back on the program. And then one more thing to say about that is this. The, the parable of the soils, you know, it says that God's always out there just talking to the world, right? He's telling everybody, you know, come have life. Well, it says when he throws those seeds out there, see, we hear seeds all the time. You hear it on the radio. Some of you are hearing some seeds right now for the first time. It's talking about God. You know, you, you see it in a book. You hear it on a sermon. You have a thought. You have a dream. Whatever. There's seeds. God is always speaking. It says the creation is declaring. The creation every day it says, look at this thing. God made this. It's screaming to people. There is a God. This wasn't a fluke. Come on, guys. And, and so God's talking all the time. Well, what the parable of soils say, sometimes our hearts are so closed down to God, it's like rocky ground and the seed hits the rock and just bounces off. It doesn't go anywhere. So somebody can stay, stay like they are, even though God's talking to them. The second seed, now they're probably not in a position of faith at that point, but that's how you know, it bounces off. That can happen even a 
people of faith sometimes. It says the second one they hear, go, oh yeah, you're right. I'm going to get better. I'm going to do this. And they're going to give up the program. But it doesn't really last. They give up their motivation. They go back to the way they were and they don't change. The third soil is the one that scares the hell out of me. Okay. Here's the third soil. It says it, it falls in there. It falls in there. It goes in the soil. The seed falls in there. We hear it. But then we get distracted by, get this, the worries and the riches and the pleasures and the desires of this life. In other words, Instagram and, you know, what kind of house I live in or what kind of car I drive or what somebody's, you know, opinion of me is or how much, you know, many nice clothes I can have or how many awards in my job I can get or whatever it is that has nothing to do with anything of any real significance. It says that we care more about that than we care about growth. And he says it just doesn't produce the growth of people. So you might have somebody that's just really concerned about just all their stuff, this self-centered, materialistic Instagram life that all they care about is their image or whatever, probably not going to change much. But the fourth soil is the one that I just pray, I don't know, it's not every day, but I kind of, sort of, it's an ongoing prayer in my life. God save me from being the third soil and help me be the fourth one because I really do want to hear you when you're speaking and I want it to fall into place where I try to do something about it. So that is uh, there's a few of the ways um, that the narcissist can be a narcissist and uh, still say they're a believer. Okay, um, so let's see. Um, I'm looking for my ah this thing is moving pretty fast here um tell me our charts okay my son's a christian he's 24 he talks to his friend in a brutal mean way i spoke to him told me he needs to be an example of jesus christ and he told me that iron sharpens iron that's why he talks to his friend like that if he wasn't my son i would not be friends with him how can i get him to realize he's being a bully um, well, I think probably um, a couple of things would be good to ask him um, and ask you also. Is it just this friend? I mean, I've got friends. We talk to each other. <laughs> Sometimes other friends would be around and go, you guys even like each other? I go, yeah, we totally, you know. It's kind of like iron sharpens iron, and we, you know, we're pretty tough with each other, right? And some people just don't feel comfortable with that. The big question is, how does the friend feel? So if the friend is, they got on the gloves and they like to, you know, kind of punch each other in the ring, then no harm, no foul, right? But two things. Does he talk to everybody like that, not just his friend who wants to play rough with him? Well, that's a different deal. That's more of a character thing, okay? Because you can tell him, even though the Bible says iron sharpens iron, the Bible also says that we have to be different with different people. First Thessalonians 5 says, with the weak, we help them. We're very gentle. We help people that aren't strong. With the brokenhearted, we comfort them. We heal them. With the unruly, we can be firm with them and admonish them. So see, different people need different things. And if that's his only way of relating people to people, I would sit down and say, well, if you're going to use the Bible verse, son, to say iron sharpens iron, I, you know, that's true. But it also says that um, sometimes you don't use iron at all. Sometimes a soft answer turns away wrath. Sometimes you restore somebody gently when they have fallen, like Galatians 6 says. Sometimes it says it's the kindness of the Lord in Romans 2 that turns us around. So I'd say, if you're telling me you want to be biblical about this, then I think you need to read the rest of the Bible, okay? So ask the friend, look at the whole pattern, and remind him, that's not the way this whole thing works. And the big deal that I would want him to do is I'd want him to go ask his friend. That's what I'd want him to do. 
Okay, let me see here. Um, I'm still not getting any uh, any texts of uh, of questions from there. So I'm going to go back on here. Um, here's one. Uh, Carrie wants to know: Can a can a narcissist truly change? Absolutely. You know, this is one of the things that drives me crazy, 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 crazy. I hear it all the time. I hear somebody say, well, you know, I talked to my therapist, said my wife was a borderline or said my husband was a narcissist and they can't change. So all hope is gone. Bull. La, 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 la. Come on. It's not true. It's just not true. All right. Is it true that it is more difficult? Yes, it's true. Some things are more difficult than others. Okay. You know, more difficult to treat COVID than it is to treat the normal flu. All right, yeah, it's more difficult. And we all have our maladies and we all have our personality and characterological problems. All right, so more difficult. But can they change? Absolutely, they can change. The problem is a lot of times they don't get the ingredients around them that will help to integrate them. The other problem is there's so much crap out there about what narcissism is and what it's not. And not only that, people not doing a differential diagnosis on the characterological structure of the person that's being called a narcissist. Okay, sometimes you see people that are narcissistic because they have deep, deep feelings of shame and woundedness and littleness and all of that. They built this grandiose self around them and they're sort of like really empty and, and, and then, but they're living out this big thing and seeking admiration and everything about them to kind of puff up their ego. See, that's a very vulnerable person, even though they look like a big strong person sometimes. The second big category in narcissism, they're not vulnerable at all, people. These are not little shame-based wounded puppies. Some of them are actually want to be and do believe and act like they're God. And theirs doesn't come from shame. It comes from envy. It comes from envy of wanting everything that exists for themselves and more and never is enough. And, you know, they destroy a lot of times people on the other side. It's, it's, it's malignant. See, so when we say narcissist, what are we talking about? Because you have to have different approaches with the different kind of narcissist. And one requires more limits. One requires a combination of certain kinds of limits with a lot of empathy getting them into the vulnerability where you can build them up. The other requires that, you, that they have to be humble sometimes before they can even admit to a need. So long, long story, but narcissism has been being treated along with, with borderline personality disorder for since I was in graduate school. I used to go to you know gazillions of hours of training to, to help them, and I have seen them make unbelievable, incredible transformation. So don't let anybody ever tell you that it's impossible because it's not. Okay, here we go. I like this one. Uh, David says, hey, I'm living proof. Repentance and deep change is difficult, but possible with a solid support team. Way to go, David. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I bet you that solid support team didn't just give you a trophy every time you breathe, right? Because that can build a narcissist, right? They didn't just support you and tell you how wonderful you are and your poop doesn't smell and all of that. I bet they supported you and loved you, loved you and did validate the good. You're really gifted at this and you're great at this. And let me see that again. Wow, what a great idea. And you know, when you said that a moment ago, that sounded kind of harsh. Can you try it again? See, they gave you love and limits. Love and limits. I bet that's what that support team did. Because what that does is it integrates us. It brings us together. It brings the splits together. See, the narcissist has a big split, among other things, of the ideal self versus the real self. So we got to gradually kind of get them to give up 
that wish to be ideal, but make it safe for them to be real. And then the real gets better and better and better. And then they take off their, their, their uh, snake skin. And all of a sudden a different person appears than was hiding behind that narcissistic bravado. Okay. Um, let's see what we got going on here. Um, if hurting people hurt others, how can you help them without being hurt yourself? <laughs> Boy, that's a good question. Um, her, uh, hurt people do hurt people. Not all hurt people hurt people. Let me clarify that. Um, <laughs> Michelle's going, ha ha, tell us how you really feel. Okay, I did. It drives me crazy. Um, but it, it is a saying that you hear out there. Most of the good way to take that, I think, we hear that, you know, hurt people hurt people is we're not saying anybody that's been hurt is going to hurt people. What we're saying is most of the time when we use that is that if somebody's hurting somebody, they were probably hurt. Okay. Usually not all the time. Usually they're just not going to say that bad word. Not going to do it. No, not going to do it. Anyway, some people are just mean, right? And that's got to be fixed. But how do you keep from getting hurt in the process? Well, um, how about this? Strength. That's how you do it. Strength. Think about this. Um, if you got a little baby and they're hurting or hurt people, they're going to try to hurt, right? They're screaming and yelling and calling you names in their own language and, and flailing. and. <laughs> well, think if that were in a 40-year-old body. What would that look like? It looked exactly like that. And that's what some 40-year-olds look like when they're hurt and they pound people and yell at people and all sorts of stuff. But when you got a baby, you're strong. So what do you do? You even move towards that baby and you pull them close and you, you calm them down and then you use your strength to transform them. And they put their ears back like my little Finley. My Doberman Pinscher, who's now no longer little, you know, if I remember I got her, what, six weeks ago? She's tripled in size. Can you believe that? But, you know, if I contain her, you know, if I'm stronger than her and say, no, Finley, you can't do that, you know, and then she goes, oh, okay, and her ears go back. Now she's in the submissive pot. So she says, okay, Dad, what do you want to teach me? I'm listening now. If her ears aren't back, she's not listening. Okay. But see, that requires strength. Now, that's an infant, and you're stronger. If that person's bigger, they may overpower you. Plus, you may have injuries of your own that it triggers. So it depends on how strong you are. And that's why, for example, you know, I remember when, um, when I used to work inpatient a lot in uh, a psych unit, there were, there were times where um, uh, I might be the, on, the only male on the floor at night, no staff, and somebody's getting really, really aggressive, and, and you know, it could, could kind of get kind of dangerous. And I remember sometimes, and I've, had, I've been kicked in the face with, with boots, I've been thrown across rooms, I've been hit, I've been punched, all of that. But sometimes that was because I walked in the room intentionally and said, okay, I'm going to sit down with you and we're going to sit on the floor and we're going to solve this. Okay, so sit down and let's start talking here. And I knew at some level that with that person, I was big enough to contain it. Okay. Not everybody would want to do that. And at the time, I was way different. You know, I was younger and stronger, and I was a karate champion and a bunch of other stuff. I, I wasn't that afraid. But some people wouldn't want to go in there. And there were some people who were bigger and scarier and more disturbed. I wouldn't go in there either. So the question is, who are you equipped to deal with? That's why we don't send the same counselor to deal with every single every single person. There are people, I get calls all the time where, you know, somebody needs a referral. They tell me about this, you know, big time CEO type who's a bully and all of this. Um, there's some counselors I'm not going to send them to because I can't handle them. You know, they're not used to being with power figures and telling them to shut up, sit down and listen. 
and they get duped. And a lot of marriage counseling, for example, goes bad because the counselor's not strong enough to contain, you know, one of the parties and they, they go in there and kind of rule the counseling. So my answer to, to this is, how do you do it? Well, you make sure that you're dealing with your own hurts so you don't have a lot of triggers. And where you do have them, you don't expose yourself to that. And you deal with the level of hurt people that that you can deal with. And our goal is to get a better immune system all the time, all the time. I've tweeted before, and some people got mad at this, um, but I've tweeted before, and this this is just true. I mean, one of the one of the ways you can tell the strength of somebody is how easily they get offended. What does it take to offend you? Somebody doesn't like your outfit or didn't say hi in the way you want to say. See, some people have such entitlement needs for everybody to treat them in a certain way. They instantly get offended. That is not a strong person. A strong person is Jesus on the cross. Yeah, he... He could take offense at what was happening to him, right? He didn't do anything wrong. He was getting crucified. But he didn't take offense. He said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. So our ability to deal with destructive people is directly related to how strong and how easily offended or hurt we're going to be. And that's not a moral judgment. That's just saying sometimes you're walking around a lot of trauma and you can get easily hurt and that's not a good scenario for you. Go minister to people that, that aren't aggressive and, and hurt others. Not everybody is the same. Um, okay, so this thing is um, reading any kind of spirit. Uh, I, uh, sorry guys, I'm here all by myself today and I'm not getting the regular questions that we get um, over headphones. Um, so thank you, Abigail. Glad you're enjoying this. Um, I want to see if here's a good one. I want to see if I can publish a book, but I can't get started and step out and let somebody read my stuff. How do I gain the motivation and courage to try it and face possible rejection? Good question, Aaron, because it doesn't apply to just you. It applies to all of us when we do something we've never done. I um, I've written some books. Um, I don't know exactly how many. They, they they tell me it's somewhere around 40 or so. I don't really know. Um, but I'll tell you a little secret here, which, um, you know, if I didn't want to take a lot of time away, it's around here somewhere because I was just showing it to one of my kids again as they're venturing out and trying something new. I have a letter framed. I'm in my study. And I have a letter framed in my study from... Um, one of the big publishers, when I wrote my first book, Changes at Heal, and I submitted the manuscript to this publisher, and I got a letter back, <clears throat> and here's what it said. Dear Dr. Cloud, I'm going to paraphrase. Dear Dr. Cloud, um, received your manuscript. Thank you for sending it, but we have to tell you that we don't think anyone would ever be interested in reading any of this. It's to this, and it's to that, and it's not this, and it's not that. And we really don't think that it's worth, they, you know, paraphrase, they said, Dear Dr. Cloud, this is a bunch of crap. Give up your even fantasy that you think you're going to ever write a book because nobody's going to publish it, nobody's going to read it. And so hope your other pursuits in life go well. That's kind of a paraphrase. Well, I framed that letter later. Um, for some reason, I, I kept it and I found it later. Um, and I have used it with my girls a lot because every time they wanted to go do something that they might fail at, I was trying to teach them, yeah, you might fail in your first try, right? And here's a letter that tells you, well, you know, I'm not trying to sound weird here, but, you know, um, 15 to 20 million books down the road and that guy said nobody would ever want to read this crap well 
that's just not true. That was just one person's opinion. Now, I did have to take from that and ask, how do I get the crappy parts out of it and learn to be a better writer? But my point here is when you're thinking about this, I want you to consider the fact that your goal is not to not be rejected or not to not be criticized. Okay. Your goal is to express yourself in words, to share that with people who can give their feedback to you that you can become curious about and say, huh, I wonder why it sounded that way to them. How can I change that to where it communicates what I really wanted to communicate? And we learn to see this rejection or criticism as a gift. Okay, when a pilot's flying an airplane, they're headed to New York, but the GPS says, no, you're actually headed to Miami. The pilot didn't go, oh, I'm a loser. Oh, you criticized me. Oh, I'll never be able to fly a plane. No, what do they do? Oh, thank you for the feedback. Now we get back on the train. So I want you to reframe feedback as something to be curiously looked for and listened to. And also get your ego or your, you know, woundedness or your heart, go get that taken care of somewhere, not in the performance realm of life, but in the performance realm of life. Don't get attached to the results. Okay? Get attached to the expression. So I can't I can't mention the name, but the other day I was um with uh one of the biggest recording artists in the world, you would know. And we're talking about the, 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 the psychology, the space you have to get into your head for your best performance. Because, you know, this person performs in front of, you know, hundreds of gazillions of people in arenas and all over the world. And how do you get in that space? And one of the main dynamics that we were talking about, which all the research talks about, which I help performers with all the time, is that in the way he put it, here's how he put it. He says, the best thing that I can do to get the best performance is realize it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If I miss a note, if they don't clap, if the song sucks, it doesn't matter. Which is what we try to do with athletes. Detach yourself from the result. Okay? When I'm shooting the basket, I want to be in the experience, not worrying about whether it's going to go in or not. Because then we're in an evaluative part of our brain. So get your woundedness taken care of. But start to put it out there. Start with some safe people. They, you know they love you, but they'll tell you the truth. I want you to get the truth. And then you can get there. Okay. Um, let's say, what is this? Um, hey, J.K. Rowling got the same letter. Sarah, <laughs> that's good. That's really good. And she's, she's um, had a few people read her books, right? Um, you know who else got that letter? 35 times. John Grisham, 35 rejections of his very first manuscript, A Time to Kill. How about that? 35 rejections. By the way, some of you out there, I am going to kick your butt right now. All right, some of you got a book in you. Some of you got a little business idea in you. Some of you got a ministry idea. Some of you got an idea. And you go, oh, I would like to write a book, or I would like to do this, and I would like to... And I go, why, didn't, why haven't you done it? And they go, well, I just don't have time. I love this story. It was my story, too. I never had time. I, I, I never had, had time off to write. I was working 50 hours a week for 40 years. But here's what John Grisham did. He was a state uh, legislator. He was in the House of Representatives in Mississippi, I think, or Senate. It, but it was in Mississippi, my home state. And he was a full-time attorney. A lot of work, a lot of time. But he had this dream. 
He wanted to be a writer. So what did he do? He said he got up every morning 30 minutes early. And he wrote one page. So, next day, one page. Next day, one page. Next day, one page. At the end of the year, he's sitting there and adds up to about 365 pages, doesn't it? Hey, that's a big book, people. And then they edit down about 20-something percent of that, and there you got your standard 286-page novel. 150 million copies later, probably more than that by now. But he didn't have time to write a book. Come on. Get your goal going. Get over the fear of rejection. Get your goal going and take some little, little, little steps. Okay. Um, let me see. Um, where are we here? Um, let me see. Uh, trying to get to next question, question, question. Um, first, uh, well, um, a lot of comments. Trying to get to a question here. And now I hear your story. I'm in the same situation. Uh, here, uh, uh, well, I don't know. Somebody said, not sure if Dr. Cobb's comment was a blanket statement. It does take a tremendous amount of work. There are a lot of choices. Lot. Probably my comment about can narcissists change, if it's can they, yeah, it's a blanket statement. They can. You know, it doesn't mean they all do, right? That's not what I was saying. Um, but, you know, change happens. Uh, let's see. Um, well, sorry, it's hard to... Uh, it's hard to get to, we're kind of out of time anyway. I want to get to one one more question, um, if we could. Um, okay. Uh, well, all right, I don't want to um, uh, keep you guys waiting while I was, I was looking for a question. Um, so anyway, anyway, it is, I mean, we are out of time. I um, I love hanging out with you guys. Um, you know what I would like to know, because um, we're still figuring this out as we go along. Um, uh, there's a couple of things that I've tried on this show as we've been doing here for a little bit. Um, one is I, I, I usually do a piece of content in the beginning, kind of talk a little bit about a topic for about 10 minutes or so. And then we go to call in questions. Um, other times we've taken some email questions and just just answered those like that. And um, then today I did it, you know, responding to the ones that come up. I'd be curious to know just just your thoughts. Um, do you like to call in? More time on that? More time on just content? Are we about the right mixture now? I want to find that out. Um, so if you could let us know that. And also, um, please share the program with people. Um, that's how we're going to build an audience. And, you know, we've been doing this in lockdown. At some point, I got to go get back out of the house <laughs> and be doing other kinds of work. But here's the deal. And I'm going to make a deal with you guys. If this audience grows to a place where it is, you know, it's it's a it's a significant happening every day, then I will carve out the time to do that even after COVID is gone because I love talking to you guys. I really enjoy this. We just have to get a big enough audience to make it, you know, sustainable and viable. And so share it with everybody. And if you share it, we'll we'll continue to do it. Also, they can also get it. Um, on the boundaries.me podcast, wherever you get your podcasts on iTunes or other places, you can get it there. And then also remember, 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 go to boundaries.me. Everything I talk about here, there's courses on boundaries.me about narcissism, where it comes from, how to deal with it. What do you do if you're in a relationship with one? How to reach those goals where you're afraid of rejection. Boundaries.me is an entire, think of it's sort of like a Dr. Cloud Netflix, okay? Think of it that way, that you log on, you have access to the entire library 
of 70 different courses on all sorts of things about life. That's what Boundaries.me is. So come join it, be a subscriber, join some of the groups or forums if you want, share your life, and let's all go about this and get better. Okay? Great to be with you guys. Sorry about our technical problems. We'll be back tomorrow, um, back in the normal way of doing this. Okay? Um, talk to you then. Bye-bye. And we'll post the time, by the way. Maybe a little early tomorrow. Okay.